We are live. Yay! Welcome everybody to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I am Brandon Testers. I am a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy for very, very many reasons. Uh, with me today and many times again in the future is Caitlin Miller. Um, Hello. Yeah, um, I work at Effective Artistry. I'm an LPC and I am super excited to join and I hope to be here many times. Um, fascinating and super fun. Yeah, Caitlin is one of our staff therapists. There's a bunch of fun like acronyms for different types of therapy I can hear. Uh, I'm an ABCD. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's something that, like I didn't even know until I started training and I think a lot of people generally don't know, is there isn't actually a, a therapist license. There's yeah. Therapy and therapists are, are kind of broad terms. So some people are counselors, some are social workers, some are uh, clinical psychologists, and some are psychiatrists, although those last, that last one especially is very rare to do actual therapy these days. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, back when people were just laying on couches and not looking at their psychoanalysts, that's when psychiatrists were doing therapy. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, a lot of what we were talking about like last week or the last few weeks when we're talking about neurodiversity and the medical model and all that stuff, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Freud, all that psychoanalysis stuff did start from that medical model. It was very like, it was, it was medical doctors for the most part, whereas yeah. counseling, what most therapies from these days started mm -hmm. as a different thing, started as career counseling, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, Caitlin and I both work at a practice called Effective Artistry. We do individual, couple, family therapy. We specialize in utilizing a neurodiversity affirming approach. We're also connected with some executive functioning coaches for people who are looking for non therapeutic, like non clinical support. Um, we're in Illinois, so we can only work with, for therapy, we can only work with people who are physically located in the state of Illinois. We're trying to get some laws passed to change that. Have you heard anything about the, the compact that they're trying to get done, Caitlin? We'll have to talk. No, about sounds that. good. <laughs> there is one instituted that should start taking place, but only like 12 or 13 states are signed up, and the Illinois mm. State Legislature is considering it in this session. Wow. Anyway. It would be super fun to work with artists like all over the country, you know, especially in hubs like Atlanta, LA, New York. Yeah, and, and California and New York are probably going to be the last two to join any kind of. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> anyway. So what we do here, this is not therapy. We're both therapists and we'll talk about things that are theoretically relevant to therapeutic concerns, but we're not doing therapy. We're just having a conversation and we always pick a topic, which today's topic is just sensory sensitivity. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Um, but also those of you here, you are free and in fact encouraged even maybe to, to put your comments into the chat. Uh, Caitlin mm -hmm. is monitoring the chat for us today uh, because wherever we go is where we go. If, if Caitlin and I are talking, we start on sensory sensitivity and we go somewhere else, then we go there. If we go somewhere else because people are talking about or asking about other things, we go there. Um, but of course, if you have questions about sensitivities and whatever, just communication is about impacting one another. And if, if you're paying attention to the things that we are saying, then we will be impacting you and we'll be paying attention to anything we can from you and it will impact us and what we're doing at mm -hmm. Which makes it more fun. Yeah. It adds ex extra elements, so. Yeah, a lot of times this thing, especially when nobody's commenting, ends up turning into more of like almost a lecture series with the hope, mm -hmm. the idea is that it's just like an open forum, like open office hours, let's sit and talk. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff we're talking about, as we'll see today actually too, is stuff that isn't very well defined, certainly not in like the public consciousness, but not even yeah. in official scientific and clinical terms. It's, it's stuff that people are just kind of exploring and trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. That happens best when we can all do that together. We can all contribute mm -hmm. our thoughts. So. And I kind of like how a lot of neurodiversity feels like it's on the frontier of whatever we want to call it, psychology, sociology, the world, <laughs> brains, all those it things. It really is like a it, frontier is a good term for it because it's being mm -hmm. fought over and people are staking claims and I don't mm -hmm. like all of that. 
I don't like that way of thinking about it, but it is, you know, it's a, people are putting out their thoughts about things and things become more or less, you know, crystallized or fossilized in the, in the public mind. Um, mm -hmm. Then it's hard. We talk about language all the time. Once people have an understanding of what a term or something means, it's very hard to get that to change. So then you got to look at finding new language instead. And Yeah. Anyway. I like it. It keeps me on my toes as a therapist. Like it really, it makes it more fun. It keeps me awake. So, you know. Honestly, I, I've said in the past, and this is obviously a very like provocative statement. I think the field of psychology is counterproductive to what therapy is attempting to accomplish. The, yeah. the more psychology influences a particular therapeutic process, the, the more detrimental it is. Yeah. Yeah. Psychology is essentially at its root, it's the science of trying to understand human behavior and, and experience and function. It's trying to understand why people experience the things they do and do the things that they do. And it's interesting because as I've kind of dismantled psychology from my therapy practice, it's just become, at least it seems that it's become quite more effective. Yeah, I mean, psychology is useful, like a lot of these things, especially stuff that's based on a lot of re uh, like clinical research and whatever. Yeah. It's very useful at scale. It's really not very useful in an individual situation, like I don't want a therapist. I do this as a therapist and, and train people to. I don't want a therapist to come in thinking that they already know stuff about the client or that if the client is saying something to the therapist, the therapist is in their head thinking like, sure, they're saying this, but really it's this other thing. The more you think you understand somebody without referencing their own communication to you, the less you are incentivized to pay attention to what they are doing and saying. Yeah. Yeah. And something I'll talk to about people too is like two people could come in with the exact same sort of demographics and general concerns. And then the therapeutic approach can be so different because of their use of language and their own like unique uniqueness in general. Um, so I find that fascinating. Whereas like regular psychology would be like, okay, let's do CBT on your anxiety and challenge these thoughts and it'll work for everybody. And then the clients that come to us are like, it didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. And and as with everything, those things are useful to the extent that they're useful. People get benefit yeah. from it. So it's not about trying to take away from that. It is just the scale that you're working on dictates the tools that you use, right? Like if you're trying to do something with a lot of people in a short period of time or design a system that many people have to go through, you're going to want to do the best you can to kind of come to the mean and like understand how most people will be impacted by something. But the whole point of individual therapy is that it is one-on-one. -on -one. If, if it wasn't, then why are we wasting resources having one person in the room at a time if it's not meant to be completely individualized, you know? Yeah. So all these things, I like a lot of CBT, but they just the tools to use in different scenarios, you know? Anyway. Yeah, and something I like about, um, the individualized approach as well is one of the reasons why I chose psychology from opera and photography and other artistic stuff was to do something super complicated. And like this one single human mind is so complex and actually approaching it as it is, is it's such a challenge and I love it so much. So. And that's what neurodiversity affirming means at its core is we just, it's not just words that everybody is unique, which is something everyone will say and acknowledge. But that also means that everybody responds to everything differently, which kind of transitions us into what we're talking about today with sensory sensitivities, because different people respond differently, even to the same stimuli. Mm -hmm. And it's you got to recognize that and eliminate this idea that people should respond to a certain stimuli in a certain way. Should yeah. have something to do with it when you're talking about one person. Shall I grab some of the questions, Brandon? Let's start talking about sensory sensitivities. And we can, I do like to start, I know you started to put together an outline a bit. I do like to start usually by kind of defining some of these terms we're going to be using so that we don't have to do caveats as we go along. But yeah, start us off somewhere. Um, well, do you want me to start with the questions that were submitted via Twitter? 
Uh, sure. Well, what were they? Yeah. Um, we have, how can, one of them is, there are two of them. One of them is how can parents slash caregivers ensure that a child with food aversion slash sensitivity to taste or texture is getting a balanced diet? And then the second one was, are there certain types of clothing or fabric that are less likely to cause discomfort? Both good questions. And we can start with those, but, but we won't get in. Then we'll, afterwards, we'll get to like general, what is sensitivity and, and whatever. Um, okay. I don't know. What do you think? Where should we start? I think we should start with what is sensitivity because sometimes Brandon, when you define things, I'm like, oh, I can I can solve it now because we we know what we're talking about. So okay. I I think it would be nice to like define it because a lot of your definitions tend to be like maybe a Venn diagram with other people's definitions, but enough uniqueness that it's worth diving into. I don't know. Sure. Okay. Well you know, help me out. This is a conversation, if nothing else, between you and I. So yeah. I see to get a little like esoteric and verbose and whatever. But here's the thing where we start with sensory sensitivities. They're not a sensory issue by the strict definition of the term. So I want to separate out sensation from perception. Those are two different things. They're, they're separate processes. Sensation is you, are, your body, my body, all of us as humans, our bodies have um, sensory organs, sem sensory apparatus, you know, like, which are sensitive to, they respond to, they are impacted by some type of environmental data, like some type of empirical observable thing that happens in the environment. Mm -hmm. And in response to whatever particular type of thing they respond to, they change. Then they generate signals. And once those signals start getting generated, that's when we're starting to talk about perception. So sensation is an unconsidered process and you only perceive a fraction of a fraction of the things that your sensory organs sense. Meaning mm -hmm. like if we do this experiment here, you know, if everyone close your eyes and we'll be quiet for a minute here in a, you know, losing a lot of time terms in a little bit here, we'll be quiet. But when I stop talking, listen to everything that you can hear try to isolate sounds and identify sounds some of them are big and obvious you were hearing already but as you put more effort into it you should be able to identify some other softer sounds that were just fading into the background before maybe that's like the hvac system in your room or traffic from however far away outside of the walls You know, they say that in the world's most soundproof chamber, and you can open your eyes again, that people start, there's about a 20 minute level tolerance for people to be in there because they start just hearing their own like heartbeat in their ears, and it starts kind of driving them crazy. Yeah. So you sense far more than you perceive. All those sounds that you just heard when your eyes were closed, those are the result of sound waves striking your eardrums and so on. Those sound waves are coming in whether you notice them or not. But then there's a separate process called perception that dictates which of those things we notice and which we don't. So Brandon, are you saying that sensory sensitivities are essentially like nodding or what would the word be? Nodding towards perception rather than sensing, but like the more colloquial terms we use are sensing? Uh, yeah, sensory sensitivities are perceptual and or attentional mm -hmm. issues, depending on how you want to define it, not mm -hmm. sensory issues. They're sensory issues in the fact that they are related to a sense. That's why we mm -hmm. call them sensory sensitivities. So would a way to kind of replace the term be like perceptual sensitivities? I mean, we can still call it sensory sensitivity. I think that's fine. I just, I want to clarify at the beginning that this isn't about a difference in the physical structure of your sensory organs. Mm -hmm. Typically speaking, someone with an auditory sensitivity, their the structure of their auditory sensory organ, you know, the inner ear and all that stuff, is by and large going to be the same as everybody else's for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it is a sensory sensitivity in that they are more sensitive to a particular sense, but mm -hmm. the reason that they're more sensitive is because of the, the uh, 
the perceptive process is passing data through to consciousness, mm -hmm. not because their eye or ears or skin or whatever are structurally different. Okay. So that means that if we're wanting to look at how to change things, we can still accurately call them a sensory sensitivity. But if we're wanting to look at how to change things, what we actually are wanting to look at is perceptive and attentional processes, not okay. sensitive processes. Do you want to go into the difference between perceptual and attentive? Well, perception is a process and attention is a term for a resource, but they, they're effectively of all of the things that you could be conscious of, right? Again, we're only actually consciously aware of a very, very, very small fraction of all the data that we could theoretically be consciously aware of. Mm -hmm. Attention is our word for that gateway of what things we become conscious of and which ones we don't. The ones that yeah. we become conscious of, we say, are things that we've paid attention to. And attentional processes and perceptual, attentional processes are a subset of attentional processes. It's the, the processes that dictate which things get admitted into conscious awareness and to what extent and which things don't. Whereas so you're saying attentional processes are a subset of perceptual processes? Yeah, and, and maybe this is getting like overly nitpicky and splitting hair, but perception, interestingly, starts in the nerve cells that are adjacent to or connected to the sensory organs. It doesn't start in the brain. Mm -hmm. Things start getting aligned in complicated ways that I couldn't even, I don't even fully understand, much less could like get across. But it's the whole nervous system that's involved in perception. And the, the point at which, so basically first data gets mapped against what we call perceptual sets. After that, and slash is part of that is when attention starts getting dictated, like which things are most important to notice. Mm -hmm. It's also good to note that it is not a binary, this is worth noticing, this isn't. Like yeah. you would love to be aware of literally everything. It's just something we have a finite capacity to or do. Or literally so, nothing. <laughs> uh, the organism, <laughs> where it's possible, would prefer to be aware of everything. Oh, that totally. Would for survival, right? Yeah, we would survive other than our bodies eventually breaking but down. We would survive lots of things. Even that that joke right there is based on the inherent, like the experience we all have of dealing with sensory information drains some resource, which is finite. Mm -hmm. Different types drain us to different amounts. This has a lot to do with what people are talking about when they talk about sensitivities. But it is a finite resource. So effectively, those processes are kind of like, think of it as their rank ordering. This is the most important thing to pay attention to than this, than this, and to what extent. And we just take in as much as we can before we run out. It's not that things below that cutoff are, oh, unimportant. It's yeah. we got in as much as we could, starting with the stuff we thought was most important. So Brandon, I'm curious if we're dividing it between attentional and perceptive processes, would you say that attentional are more able to be manipulated by like the person themselves? No, they're both actually, they both happen pre-consciously, right? Like they're both mm -hmm. things that happen before you become conscious. You can't consciously decide what to pay attention to because you can mm -hmm. only consciously consider the things which you are already paying attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, that no. reminds me of Sam Harris talking about how free will doesn't exist. <laughs> Yeah. But that's maybe a different day. <laughs> yeah, interesting conversation, although it largely just depends on what you mean when you say free will. Yeah, exactly. So, anyway. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yes, we can manipulate these processes. And, and we'll talk a bit about that, hopefully, if we have time today. Um, well, I think to kind of focus more on the question, Brandon, would be like, you know, with the, the clothing question, are there certain types of clothing or fabric that are less likely to cause discomfort? That kind of reminds me of maybe becoming more aware of the attentional and perceptive processes that are engaged with when you're, so when you're, oh, go ahead. Conversation Sorry. is basically that. You're, I think you're mm -hmm. exactly right. When we're talking about a sensory sensitivity, what we mean is, 
that for whatever reason, my processes pass data into consciousness at, an, at a disproportionately high rate when it comes to a particular category of senses. In other words, sound, right? Auditory data is theoretically useful and valuable. Like we wouldn't have the, 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 the mechanism to be able to perceive it if it wasn't useful to us, at least theoretically. But not all sound is equally useful and some sound mm -hmm. might not be useful to us at all in any way, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially these days, the fact that we're all inside, like I can hear the rain outside. That's not super useful information to me right now because I'm inside and it doesn't impact me very much unless I'm considering going outside for some reason. Mm -hmm. So theoretically then those processes respond by bypassing that, right? Saying like, mm -hmm. okay, that's not super important information so we don't notice it. But yeah. if for some reason those processes are saying, nope, we're going to notice the rain, even though it's not useful to you. We're going to notice all these sounds, even though they are not actually useful information at this moment. And I keep saying to what extent, because that's part of it too. Your whole world can become one sound. The yeah. extent, the, the amount of detail, the depth of attention you can pay to a single thing can be that your entire consciousness is full up just of detail about that single input. That kind of reminds me of like um, flow state performance of like music, for example. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on flow state stuff too. And I would say to me, flow state is yes, when, when your entire conscious space, working memory is the term people tend to use in like executive function, whatever. The entire working memory is occupied with bringing in environmental data that is relevant to the task at hand and translating that into adapting behavior and immediately applying those trans that those um, behavioral models or whatever word you want to use. Basically, that mm -hmm. it, there's no space for thinking about anything other than what is happening in the moment, including what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's happening at the fastest optimal pace that, that a person can manage and that person is getting the optimal outcome that they can get. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is a lot like fight or flight. It's kind of the same thing, which, you know, sensitivities are the same. So anyway, when we're saying sensory sensitivity, what we mean is we have distinguished that for a person, there's a particular pattern where they bring in information about a certain kind uh, related to a certain sense a lot more than it is useful to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great thing to kind of highlight that it's a lot, a lot more than is useful to them. Which is an impossible thing to like quantitatively measure. But I but have noticed that when you ask clients that it can kind of, they have like an aha moment. Right. And it's important to know that this, like everything in neurodiversity, this is not a defect mm -hmm. because how do we know what data is going to be useful before it is useful? Mm -hmm. You know, if I feel like, oh man, I'm hearing things, think of it like picture that you are in a quiet place and you can hear a conversation just at the edge of your hearing and you really are incentivized that you heard your name or whatever. It's somebody you really want to know what they're talking about and you focus in all of your attention on trying to pick out the details in that conversation that allow you to say, oh, I think that was that word. I think that was that word, even though it's just these tiny little modifications in the sound waves. Yeah. We can all do that. Now imagine that that's what happens even when you're not trying to, and when you don't have any reason to believe that it's super useful to you, that you're just, mm -hmm. if somebody is, I don't know, chewing gum in the corner, that it's the same thing as though like you're closing your eyes and focusing in and it just becomes everything. Mm -hmm. Now we, your brain is doing that. Your nervous system, your processes are doing that because they think they have reason to believe that the data will be useful to you. And it might, right? Like if then the next moment someone says, oh, what is anyone chewing gum in here? Well, Hey, I know it. Right. Or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, these things are not wrong by default, which is why we're talking about a pattern of, of uh, experiences. 
because in any given instance, who knows if that data is useful or not? It's, it's subjective, first of all, but also it's related to the future, which nobody can know. So that brings me to another thing about sensitivity is that when people talk about it, they're talking about it only in the downsides. They're yeah. saying I'm very sensitive to X because what we notice first, those attentional processes, we notice things which are novel and things which are negative before we notice anything else. Well, I guess an example of that, Brandon, that I've experienced, and you're welcome to, you know, rebut any of this, is um, having like visual artist clients who are so perceptive to visual data that they can create just incredible, like jaw dropping oh. art. And then they might have a concurrent like sensory sensitivity regarding sound. And maybe when they're out at a restaurant, they can hear like all the conversations and they can hear their friend chewing and they can hear the beer glasses clinking together and the light is too bright. And then all of a sudden they're like having kind of like a shutdown or some people would call it like a panic attack within that. So I guess some so terms I that notice how you use the term sensitivity when talking about the auditory mm -hmm. stuff. Didn't yeah. Use sensitivity when talking about the visual stuff. I think I use the word perceptive. Perception. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that when someone is calling it a sensitivity, almost always what they're talking about is a negative experience of noticing stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying that what we're talking about is noticing, you know, paying attention to data beyond the utility of that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of course that is paired with, think of like trauma, right? Like if something traumatic happens to you in a room where the walls are painted red, it is possible. That's that always the example I give. That's so funny. You just said that. Okay, okay so continue. I wonder if one of us got it from the other. Anyway, um, yeah. later on in your life, when you enter a room where the walls are painted red, your body may enter a state of panic, fight or flight. And consciously, you might not know why. So mm -hmm. the body learns these, these things and, and yeah. it's guesses and it's not always right, right? Things that hurt us are actually helpful. Things that are enjoyable and feel good can actually be harmful. Not all the time, the vast majority of the time, the sensation matches up with the utility, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's off. So this is the same. If, for example, if you are a musician and you are paying very, very close attention to detail about all the auditory data coming in a lot of the time, your body, including the brain and the nervous system as part of your body, may not recognize all the specific contextual factors that make it a time we're supposed to be paying attention to sound at that level of detail and the times when we're not. So then you're out at the restaurant and it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It has to do with frameworks and, and we can talk about that. That's one of the things that you can do to try and help with these sensitivities. Mm -hmm. But just like everything else, when we look at it through that neurodiversity lens, upsides and downsides, it depends on what you're trying to do it depends on the context in which you are trying to do it. Mm -hmm. People with auditory sensitivities also are going to be more sensitive or perceptive to auditory data when it is useful. Mm -hmm. Like people with auditory sense, here's, here are two things which seem completely unrelated. And as far as I know, nobody's talking about them as being related that one auditory sensitivity is a fairly common occurrence with autistic people. Another fairly common occurrence with autistic people is accent matching, that that they'll start to take on the tone, yeah. the, the, the lilt, the patterns of speech of people that they're talking to. That is, those two things to me are the same. You're picking up on mm -hmm. a level of auditory detail and it's impacting the way you think and feel and act, even on levels that you're not consciously aware of. And maybe they're actors who do like amazing impressions of, you know, random places in the UK or something <laughs> and they can put it on their resume. <laughs> There's a reason that like we've conceptualized this differently. And one really like harmful, like pathological conception of this is the idiot savant where mm -hmm. we're saying, oh, this person is uniquely good at a specific thing and also uniquely bad at a bunch of things, <laughs> which often those things correlate. And even if they yeah. don't, you got to remember that all this stuff draws off of the same resources, that the extent to which I pay attention to sound, well, the resources I'm using for that, the working memory and the attention, 
are the same things I need to use for any other type of data. So if I'm disproportionately paying attention to sound, I'm disproportionately paying less attention to everything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's all this is a specialization and mm -hmm. and it does not matter for our purposes why or how this happens. Some element yeah. of it may be genetic, some element of it certainly is experiential, organic, like trauma, whatever. It doesn't yeah. really matter. We just, we arrive at the conclusion. So the first thing to do with sensory sensitivities, and this will be the like gateway into answering every other question, is to recognize- I was just gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> is that they are completely unique. Mm -hmm. I have an auditory sensitivity, you have an auditory sensitivity, that doesn't mean it's the same thing. Yeah. We are still gonna respond to auditory data, like any particular instance of auditory data, we're gonna respond differently to that thing. Mm -hmm. Other things matter. If yeah. I listen to heavy metal music, it might sound like noise and be overwhelming to my system. But also, I know a lot of people that I think either identify as or could potentially be identified as autistic who love that kind of music. People with auditory sensitivities who love that kind of music because it is very stimulating. Once you have a framework for it and it's stopped, mm -hmm. there's a difference between noise, which is auditory data that you have not mapped to any useful perceptual set. It's just sound without any form or utility to you yeah. versus sound that you have mapped against perceptual sets and frameworks and therefore can make use of. So think of it like this. If, if you listen to someone speaking a language that you don't speak, it just sounds like noise. Listen to five syllables and then try to repeat those five syllables, but you'll have a hard time even remembering what they are because your yeah. brain has nothing to, to log that away against symbolically. Mm -hmm. But in a language you speak, you can remember whole sentences word for word. Yeah. So, Brandon, the are there certain types of clothing or fabric that are less likely to cause discomfort? I'm just going to throw this out there. What I immediately go to, since I love solving problems, <laughs> is um, like experimentation. And a, a an example I can think of is I have a client who either prefers sort of like the athleisure, like polyester, whatever stuff that's going to pollute the oceans that feels like a second skin, or they prefer like super baggy, androgynous kind of um, like linen fabric. So I don't know. I've just found it interesting to talk to clients who have the sensory sensitivity of um, the feel of fabric against their skin about like what what are the specific ones that cause you more or less distress? And then how can that be optimized? I don't know if that would be kind of like I an intervention that, design. I mean, the, the literal answer to the question is yes. And like you're saying, it depends on the person. So mm -hmm. you want to look at what that person is experiencing. Again, like we were talking about psychology at the beginning, if we say, oh, this fabric and this fabric and this fabric, and then you go out and you buy it and you try it for your child who's responding to tactile, mm -hmm and it doesn't work, then you might think, oh man, well, the expert said it's this, so maybe it's not a sensitivity mm -hmm. thing or maybe blah, 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 or whatever. Oh, well, the thing I was thinking of more is well, like, what clothing do they already own and how do they respond to the things right. that, so you know? With all sensitivity issues, we wanna start there. Look at the existing patterns. First of all, look at that type of data and look at where the sensitivity to it, because sensitivity is not a negative thing. In this case, when we're using the word sensitivity, what we mean is sensitive, like an instrument is sensitive, like a, like a scale, which is sensitive and therefore measures to the nearest thousandth of a pound, as opposed to one which measures to the nearest pound and is therefore less sensitive. They can both be giving an accurate reading, but the more sensitive one gives more precision. Mm -hmm. So it's more data about the same input, not more accurate, but more precise. Uh, so look at the times where that is useful to the person because that will, should theoretically always exist, that there is yeah. some time where that amount of data is useful to the person. The only time I could think of that there would be some exception to that would be some relatively recent and very severe trauma where that type of data would theoretically have been useful. But the brain adapts very quickly. If, the, if that information is never, never, never useful, pretty soon you start deprioritizing it. Yeah. So there will be some times where it's useful. So look at that. And then you can start to say, because the key isn't that it's auditory data. 
They might be sensitive to auditory data across the board, but other variables dictate whether that sensitivity results in an unpleasant experience or a pleasant or useful experience. And you want to start looking at those variables, what makes it different between the two, and you can mess around with those. Mm -hmm. And yes, the easiest way to start is by looking at just this. What are the things you enjoy? What are the things you dislike mm -hmm. related to whatever sense you're talking about? Yeah. And just real quick, we won't go into this in detail, but I find it useful also to talk about sensitivity to data by categories other than senses. You know, yeah. like, like a sensitivity to social data, a sensitivity to data about the weather or whatever, right? Like it doesn't have to just be sensory. These are just the most commonly talked about. No. Can you give an example of how to break down um, questions like that regarding the person who's asking about clothing? Yeah, so when we're talking about clothing, if we're talking about a sensory sensitivity as opposed mm -hmm. to like a fashion sensitivity or whatever, which might be related to social feedback and et cetera. But yeah. generally people are talking about a tactile sensitivity, sensitive sensitivity mm -hmm. to the feedback of pressure and movement against the skin and such. Mm -hmm. I have a tactile sensitivity, which is why I'm doing this. Most people, if you are fidgeting in some way that involves some kind of tactile experience, clicking your pens, moving your fingers, et cetera, et cetera, then you probably have a tactile sensitivity. Now, in negative terms for myself, when it comes to clothing, seams and socks, which is a very, like, very common, almost stereotypical sensitivity issue. Yeah. I hate seams and socks. It bothers me so much. Like I, I have a hard time sleeping if I have to sleep on my side because otherwise if the weight of the blanket is on the tip of my toes, it, it causes me discomfort. Um, so when you look at something like that, then you can say, A, what things you've already discovered. For me, I now, generally I buy shoes that I can wear without wearing socks at all. Or if I have to wear socks with shoes, I wear these very like low. Here I'll show them. So maybe that, maybe this is inappropriate, but uh, I don't think it is. I think it's cool when people um, relate it to themselves. I wear these like very low cut socks that don't mm -hmm. have a seam. They have the like. Well, I guess they do have a seam, but it's somehow much much smaller than the seams yeah. that. I'm and they're up on top of the toe. They don't go anywhere near the edge of the toenail. That's the thing that bothers me the most is when it's right around where the toe and the toenail mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. These are Adidas. I just had to look them up because I just had to order a new package. Adidas. Super Brandon, Rider. do you secretly have a corporate sponsor and you're not telling us? They were playing the long game. They were just hoping that eventually it would come up. Um, <laughs> now, generally with sensitivities, here is like my kind of four step process for dealing with sensitivity issues. Number one, what can we do to limit exposure to the type of data that causes the negative sensory issue, the negative sensory sensitivity experience? So like in that case, right? That if the seams to the socks are bothering, can we eliminate any, any mm -hmm. sensation related to the seams of socks? If being in noisy spaces bothers you, can we eliminate your need to be in so noisy spaces or at least minimize it? Number yeah. one, those are, we always want to start there, limit the exposure to that data type. And again, not the sensation, we're not limiting your exposure to sound broadly. We're first looking at the, the variables that make it a negative experience versus a positive or neutral experience, right? And we're limiting your exposure to the things that make it a negative experience. Number two, after we've eliminated and minimized your exposure as much as possible, then we want to look at what things can we do to interpose some barrier between the origin of that sensory stimuli and your sensory organs. So this is where with an auditory sensitivity, we're talking about like headphones, right? Just I can't stay out of the noisy environment, but I can put something over my ear that makes the sound deadened and less when it comes to my ear. Then number three is when we're going to look at developing frameworks. This I'm putting at number three because it is by far the most resource intensive process. This is the equivalent of if you're hearing for auditory sensitivity, imagine that you're in a country where no one speaks the language that you speak 
and you're sitting at a restaurant trying to have a conversation with a person that does speak your language and everyone else around you is speaking a language you don't understand. And because of the acoustics, it's all bombarding you and hitting you. And it makes it very difficult for you to suss out the, the auditory data that's coming from the person that you understand their language versus all the sources you don't. Well, if you learn to speak that language that everybody else is speaking, then those processes which allow you to filter out signal from noise. Noise is, is data that's coming in that is irrelevant or useless. Signal is data that is coming in that is useful, theoretically. Mm -hmm. If I learn to speak that second language, then my, my processes will be better able to filter out that and isolate the one in front of me because I can identify those things. Remember, we prioritize novelty, things that we don't know what they are, and negativity, things that might potentially harm us, cause us some kind of problem. So something I don't know that's novel, and I'm much more likely to recognize it, if I can learn about that thing, in a, in a, this gets into like, what are the things that we need to put into place to have learning work well? But if I can actually learn about that thing, not just be exposed to it, but actually learn about it, then I'll be more likely to be able to filter it out. But that's a long, learning is a difficult time consuming process. Yeah. So that's what we wanna do a third. And then the fourth thing is not about changing the sensitivity, it's about changing the response. The fourth thing is just, it's draining, right? Sensing anything, even if it's useful, is draining. It takes some resource. Some versions of utilizing that resource also result in getting some resource back and it can be enjoyable and energizing, yeah. but it also involves taking something even when it's giving you something back. Mm -hmm. So then we wanna look at how do we make it so that that pool of resources, that you have more of that available to you, meaning if we've limited your exposure to it as much as possible, we've interposed as much stuff between you and between your sensory organs and the origin of the stimuli as possible, and we've done as much as we can do or continuing to do as much as we can do to learn about it, and it's still causing a lot of problems, then we have to look at what other things in your life are taking those resources and how can we either eliminate some of that or do some more stuff to get you some stuff back so that you're not if you're if you're having a meltdown every day from auditory data and you've done those three things limited interposed and learn as much as you can then the only thing we can do is say well how do we get it so that other things don't drain you and get you to the verge of a meltdown or what other things can we do to kind of restore you and, and buttress you and prepare so are you saying like if a meltdown is a 10 out of 10 and the auditory sensitivities are a 7 out of 10 then what's that 3 out of 10 and how can we reduce that so it doesn't get you to a 10 out of 10 i'm saying that if i have an auditory sensitivity to if we're going to put numbers on it let's say i have 100 points to spend on incoming sensory data mm -hmm. and if i have an auditory sensitivity compared to you that in an experience where you're spending one point per minute on auditory data, I'm spending 10 points per minute on auditory data. And a mm -hmm. meltdown is when you hit zero. I've got nothing left to make any yeah. sense of incoming data. So what that fourth thing is, is let's make it so that when you go into this scenario that you can't avoid you going in because we've already tried all that stuff, that you have 40 points left instead of 10 by the time you get there so that you can survive it as long as possible. Mm -hmm. That's a last option and it's still useful. This is a lot of what like ABA is, increasing tolerance mm -hmm. things. How long can you, how can we make it so that you can stand it for as long as possible? It doesn't make it more useful or more pleasant. It just makes it more tolerable. And mm -hmm. there's use for that. ABA does help people, even though I personally and many of us have a huge problem with everything about it. But yeah, if there was no value or utility to anyone ever, nobody, it wouldn't be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get straight to that fourth thing where we're trying to increase tolerance instead of do any of that other stuff. Shall we so, go to the food aversion question? Well, to, so to go back to the, the fabric one first, mm -hmm. look at anything that removes the type of data that they're responsive to. And what that's going to tend to be is things which are relatively static, meaning unchanging, I guess, you know, static. <laughs> the way that, that, that wasn't is. a pun. Yeah. <laughs> So that's like you were mentioning athleisure, right? Things that have compression, that's a lot of data input, but not a lot of novelty. Whereas mm -hmm. something like this is not putting data in as much because there are lots of parts of my skin that it's not touching, but the 
the flip side of that is every time I move, it's now touching me in a different place or in a different way, a different pattern. Mm -hmm. than before. So yeah. things like that leisure and compression stuff is going to get rid of that novelty issue. I compression stuff drives me crazy. I, it, it doesn't bother me when I first put it on, but I have noticed that when I wear things like that, especially around my midsection area, and this is why we don't care about why, because is that because I'm worried I feel fat or do I hate the idea of appearing to be fat because I hate the idea of something touching my stuff? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I or I'll, when you were four years old, someone told you X, Y, or Z, and Freud is right about everything. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't matter. That's the <laughs> point. We just do what we do. For me, what I've noticed is not an in, in, uh, a sense of discomfort immediately but that I go from energized to exhausted a lot more quickly, it seems like, on days where I wear something like that or will be having a perfectly lovely day otherwise, but still start to get anxious and stressed and panicky at a certain point without being able to identify it. And it's really tricky when you're looking at that, that uh, response to things because very quickly your brain will start to identify. You'll come up with stuff. If you start feeling stressed and panicky for no identifiable reason, then the very first thing you do is say, why am I stressed and panicky? And you start running mm -hmm. through, what could it be? What could it be? And sooner or later, you'll come up with, oh, it's probably because of this thing. Yeah. And then you say, oh, I'm stressed and panicky because of this thing, even though you were not aware of that thing. And it's very mm -hmm. likely that it was something else in the environment. Yeah. So removing the data. Yeah. And so you're going to want to look at things that make it so that it takes away change and, and or takes away input at all. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people I know, especially in my personal life, especially the young kids, you know, family members and whatever, they are the people. My brother wore shorts. We lived in Utah. Doesn't matter if it was the middle of winter and there's two feet of snow, he wore shorts and he wears flip flops unless he has to wear something else for work. You know, these kids that they get home from school and they get into their underwear right away, like the shirt and the pants mm -hmm. come off right away. Yeah. That's removing any input at all. But yeah, you're going to want things that are relatively consistent. So like single fabric, generally not like mixed materials, which you know mm -hmm. happens to be compliant with ancient biblical laws about how to wear clothes. <laughs> That's what it all is. <laughs> and then you just experiment. But yeah, you got you to gotta try it out with different people. But just start by listening to them. And if they can't identify and verbalize it, just look at patterns of, well, they don't like this kind of stuff. They do tend to like this kind of stuff and experiment with your hair. And Brandon, we have about five minutes left since I'm the not Thank father you. time, I'm mother time. Okay. <laughs> um, no food sensitivity stuff. And mm -hmm. I don't know what kinds of fat. I, I don't know enough about fabrics and stuff. So like cotton or I don't know if like wool or cotton, anything that you would. And think some of them can be blended fat. too and change as well. You'd want to look at things that would generally be considered to be soft, uh, mm -hmm. light. So I don't know what fabrics that is, but it, the, the scratchy stuff. Don't even a big know. thing for me, Brandon, too, is um, like stretchable, like fabrics where no matter what position I'm in throughout the day, I'm just like able to be yeah. and it doesn't. Like static, right? That's kind Yeah, of static. Mm-hmm. Uh, because some people you put a compression thing or a stretchable thing on them and there is the, the volume of data. And I bet yeah. this, the, at least in our culture, women and men are people who are socialized as one or the other. I, I would bet it correlates to that, but I don't know. You just expect mm -hmm. Yeah. They say something scratchy. I'm assuming this is a question on behalf, you know, a parent on behalf of their child. But if it's not, if it's you, just if, try things out before you buy them. And if it bothers you or if you happen to notice feeling bad that day, even if you don't think it's related to the thing, try something else, you know, to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Food one. Go ahead. Do you want me to repeat the question? How can parents or caregivers ensure that a child with food aversions or sensitivity to taste or texture is getting a balanced diet? Okay. Time. I will say quickly, balanced diet is a tricky concept because there are a lot of variables which dictate what a particular person needs. And so the idea that we can put together a particular set of nutritional like frequency and blah, 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 that's all based on scale. It's useful stuff, but it's based on large scale studies, not individual things. 
and there are individual variations. My middle son does not have galactosemia, but is a carrier for galactosemia and has one recessive gene, which is the thing that makes it so that drinking anything with lactose in it, if you have it fully, basically can kill you. Your body can't process it at all. It just builds up until it hits a certain level of toxicity. His doesn't do that, but it's also not, not that at all. He processes yeah. it apparently at a much slower rate. For some reason, he is very, very avoidant to meat, the texture of meat. It doesn't matter if it's beef, chicken, whatever, unless we, unless it's like ground and cooked into something. My oldest son <laughs> does not like anything touching anything else, no mixture of textures whatsoever. Everything is separate for his birthday. It's his birthday in a few days. And he wants tortilla, taco meat, shredded cheese, and cucumber all separate. He doesn't like a taco, but he likes a bunch of things that are in a taco. Store. That's so cute. I'm sorry. I just had to say something. That's adorable. So before going to too much length, like through too much difficulty to try and force some change in a diet, if you have the means, working with a dietitian to get some more individual information about your kid, but also ask yourself this, what is the problem? Not just, it isn't a balanced diet. Well, because it isn't a balanced diet, then what? Is there something happening that seems to be problematic that you think might be related to the diet and the imbalance in it? Or does everything seem to be fine and nothing's a problem? In which case, it doesn't mean that there might not be some other problem in the future, but no diet you give them would mean that there definitely won't be some problem related to that diet in the future. We over, I mean, like what we consider to be a healthy diet 20 years ago is very different than what we consider today. And it is all influenced, as we now know, you know, the food pyramid was completely debunked and replaced in large part because yeah. it was influenced very heavily by food, like growers and producers lobbying to get their stuff, you know, disproportionate. So don't put too much stress into it if it's not causing some specific problem, if it is causing some specific problem, well, then you have a metric to observe as you experiment with things to see, well, we think this might be because they're not getting enough protein. Let's try getting them more protein and then see what happens and so on and so forth. So start there. Now, then look at uh, food sensitivity is going to be gustatory. That's the fancy term for taste related, the way that like auditory or visual is gustatory. But more, in my experience that I've heard about, is actually tactile. It tends yeah, not to yeah. really be about the taste or the flavor, but about the, the feel of the food. In which case, like I was just saying, these are just common, commonly useful things. Separating things out so that you don't have mixed textures, hard stuff in a soft sauce, right? Uh, trying to, when you're trying to introduce new foods, try and keep it within a specific like a texture that you know that they're okay with, right? Like if you know they like tortilla and you want to, I don't know what something else would be that has a similar thing, but a different nutritional value. I don't know. Just try and keep I pictured it like thinly sliced zucchini or something. I don't know why I thought of that, but. Maybe. Uh, another very common thing here is that it's actually about novelty. That, for example, it's not that I can't stand anything new. It's just that something new draws my attention and I don't like having my attention drawn to what I'm eating. I, I like, there are certain things, even like universal bodily functions that for anybody, if you make them focus on it, they're going to be squicked out by their own bodily processes. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that paying attention, having my attention drawn to the process of chewing, even as I'm saying that some of you are probably getting squicked out by it, of chewing and mashing up food and eating and swallowing. I just don't want to notice it and anything novel, draws my attention to it. In that case, you might be able to look at, do things like stimming or fidgeting or whatever to draw their attention elsewhere when you're introducing new food so that it is not as intense and overwhelming. Because that's the thing about a sensory experience, a sensitivity, when it is negative, it's because of the intensity generally. It's so much that it crowds everything else out. So stimming and fidgeting both, they serve slightly different purposes, but they both serve the purpose of drawing attention elsewhere to decrease the intensity of something. So give them other things. There's a reason that a lot of us like to watch TV while we eat our dinner or you know, whatever thing. I have the hardest time remembering to eat and like, I cannot sit there and just eat and focus on my, I gotta like be reading something on my phone or talking to somebody or whatever. Mm -hmm. so drawing their attention elsewhere while you're trying to introduce new things. Uh, if you're introducing a new version of a thing, like they love pasta, for example, and you're giving them some new and different pasta, don't call it pasta. 
because then they'll compare it often to their existing knowledge of what pasta is and there any disparity then is looked at as a negative thing this isn't pasta mm -hmm. even if all you're saying is okay what you usually have is pasta this is white sauce pasta and you're just changing it by adding some stuff to like disambiguate it um small i would highly recommend this is a general piece of parenting advice stay the f away from op operant conditioning stuff when you're having to deal with mm -hmm. anything that is related to bodily processes. Don't punish and reward when it comes to this stuff. Then you start breaking people's ability to notice their own sensations and it becomes about pursuing punishment or pursuing reward and avoiding punishment. It just, it yeah. gets messed up. It causes all kinds of problems on your, you can't stop it later on. It's just, it's a lot. Same thing with toilet training and stuff. So a lot of quick, See, this is what I always do. I spend so much time talking about terms, and then I want to give examples. And I run out of time. No, that was great. I mean, how many more examples could you have given in five minutes? It was impressive. How many more in five minutes? But if I had another five, I could give a lot more. Yeah, that's why I was trying to be nice, and I just said the five-minute thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the is, and for those of you who are asking questions, when you do, the more detailed information you give me, the more mm -hmm. specific an answer I can give you. And I yeah. like to do general things because they're general. They apply like the one, two, three, four of how we respond. Like what is the mm -hmm. sensitivity? How do we go about it? Look into variables, blah, blah, blah. That applies to any sensitivity issue, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you a lot of actionable stuff. General is broadly yeah. applicable, but not very actionable. Mm -hmm. Specific is very actionable, but you got to give me a lot of specific information in order. Otherwise I'm taking a specific request and giving an answer to information that isn't specific to you. If yeah. I were to say, oh, cotton is great. I don't know what's going on with you and your family and your, or your mm -hmm. child, yourself or whatever. So we mm -hmm. don't want information from other sources and other experiences and act as though it's gonna apply to you. It might, yeah. but that's why we wanna talk about the reasonings behind it. The oh, I, I love that part. I'm all for that part. Yeah, well, thank you for keeping me on time because otherwise I would, want to sit here and give a bunch of other specific thoughts and recommendations. Yeah. Maybe someday this dream will be two hours. <laughs> yeah. oh, color. That also matters sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not just texture, but color. And temperature. Yeah. And spiciness. If people have food aversions of any kind, generally you're going to want to avoid spiciness. An experience which is already intense for people yeah. who don't have a sensitivity is going to tend to be really intense for people who do have mm -hmm. all right make me stop Caleb. <laughs> you're explaining my whole childhood brandon thank you <laughs> make when we talk about it in this way the like more diversity way instead of oh it's some why is caitlin so terrible at eating spicy food what that's not a yeah thing that yeah anyway. well i was so happy to be here today i am so happy to be here today and yeah. I don't know. What do we say? This is the this is not therapy hour, and <laughs> I, I was gonna say same bat time, same bat channel. But earlier this week, I said send out the bat signal, and you didn't know that reference. So yeah, know. no, but you're helping me, man. It, it's same I got it. That channel is in the 1960s Adam West's version of Batman. At the end of the episode, <laughs> they say we'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, there we go. And yes, Caitlin will be around, if not every week, you know, most of them, or at least that's the plan. We're hoping, yeah. Even when Marie is back, it'll be the three of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. A trio. So, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, I don't know how to sign off of this, so. Say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> oh, did you mean technically? I have to Yeah. Go.